who, who spends most time with brain tumour patients in hospital? Who spends most time with brain tumour patients in hospital? Is it the doctors? Very unlikely. Is it the nurses? Well, possibly, especially if you're more awkward or more problematic. But the person who actually spends most time were occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech therapists. They're the ones who spend most time with the patient. But they're the ones who have absolutely no training in the care principles at that time, had no training in the care principles for someone with a brain tumour. So I heartily endorse us trying to do what we're trying to do. Because I think you guys really do need to be able to take on all those issues which are the professional bits about what your job is, but also this other dimension, which is about caring for someone with a brain tumour. It's a really difficult issue, so I'm delighted to see you all. So, uh, I couldn't possibly stand here and ask this question and then go back on it and say, well, maybe not. I mean, the answer is uh, all patients should be uh, involved in trials. So those of you who need to leave the room now can go. But uh, the, the issue here, of course, is that this rather scrubby graph that I drew many years ago puts on uh, in colours some of the uh, improvements that we have seen. But you can still see, and as you heard uh, in the video, the outlook for patients with these high-grade glial tumours is just awful. Uh, and although we've seen some improvement, we sometimes ourselves get carried away with small improvements. But to a patient to be able to say, oh, well, we can give you another six months, is hardly, you know, Christmas, is it? So uh, we need to think very carefully about what we're actually trying to do. And so there's a lot of scope for improving the situation, and indeed that's what we, we've really got to do. So what I want to do is to take you through one or two ideas about trials and then explain to you a little bit about how I think we can actually improve the situation uh, for patients. So let's start with, many of you recognise, I'm sure, this, uh, this graph. This is the graph about the temozolomide data, which was published in around about uh, 2005. This is the EORTC study comparing temozolomide and radiation against radiation alone. Bearing in mind, radiation alone is the first real modality for treatment which show benefit for patients with high-grade tumours. So here we've got what they call Kaplan-Mayer or survival graphs. And uh, in this uh, y-axis, we've got the percentage surviving. And along here, we've got time. And these two graphs plot the two populations of patients. So those in the red line are the ones who had radiation alone. And those on the blue line are the ones who had temozolomide and radiation. And, of course, this was the first major trial that showed any real improvement. And we all got very, very excited about this, and this was presented at the big cancer meetings and has now become, obviously, a standard for treatment. But there are some issues about this that you really, really ought to know a little bit about. The first thing was that when you look at 24 months, this was the bit that got people excited. If you, if you just get radiation alone with this tumour, then you've got about an 8% chance of surviving two years. Whereas if you had temozolomide added on, there was about a 20% chance of surviving two years. So we thought that was great. That was the first real result we've got. But as I said to you, that's not a lot of difference. And in fact, this trial failed, according to ERTC standards. It actually, didn't, it actually was not a success in the sense that it was set out to demonstrate a three-month improvement in median survival, and it never did that. So at that level, it was a total failure as a trial. But it was this bit uh, which uh, shows us that there are benefits for patients in it. So that's very interesting. The other thing which some of you may not quite understand is that this was the last death rows for temozolomide. Temozolomide had been around for many, many years, tested in lots of cancers, and found wanting. And there was a lot of argument in Europe about whether it did or did not do anything. So in classic European style, and I hope you're all going to vote one way or the other. I'm not going to tell you which way I'm going to vote. But the idea was that we have a compromise. So those who thought if you give it with radiation, we'll get a result. And those who thought if you don't give it after radiation, you get So they just joined the two together and everybody said, it's a rubbish trial, it will never work. So serendipity comes into play here. Bizarrely, it showed a result. And that result, as you know, has been very well translated into clinical practice. Now, the important thing that comes from this is, as I say, is that we've got clinical practice issues from it. But when we try to look more carefully at what the causes were uh, for these differences, so this opened up a whole area, and this is one of the first demonstrations of a biological principle to do with methylation of promotocytes in cancer, which made a huge difference. And indeed, whereas in the previous graph you're looking at mixed groups of patients who may or may not respond, 
In this graph, what you're looking at is selecting patients out because they have a marker which shows that they're likely to respond to temozolomide. And the difference then is, instead of living 20% living uh, two years, that if you've got the right marker, then you've got a 47% chance of living two years. So here we have an important principle, being that if you can identify a biological marker here, then there's a better chance of being able to do well in a trial. And that begs the question, God, does that mean a lot of the trials we've done, we've lost a benefit because we've just not gone about doing it the right way? And of course, the worry for a lot of doing this is maybe there is something there and we missed it all. But this is a very important concept. And from all of this, we've been looking now at different genetic nature of these uh, tumours and looking very carefully to see if there are any what they call marker genes, which tell us how things are going to go. And quickly before I take this one, oh no, this is, a, this is one of the more important ones we've picked up. This one is IDH1. Don't worry too much about it. But IDH1 is one of those genes that we've picked up now, which is incredibly important in glioblastoma because if you've got the mutated gene, you're going to do twice as well as if you haven't got this mutated gene. So these are important stratifying principles for trying to understand why patients might do better or worse with treatments and think what an impact that could have when you come on to do trials. And of course, all this now is coming together in quite complex issues. And those of you who are aware of it know that new WHO classifications come out, which is very much based on being able to identify and label patients by virtue of their genetic components. So a lot of that work has come directly out of the success, apparent success, with temozolomide in these tumours. Because we got a result, people got interested, they did a lot more work in this area. So what do we take from all of this? We, it's unlikely that there is a single magic bullet that will cure all tumours for GBM. We sort of think there's got to be something out there that will cure this. But the reality is it probably isn't, and we're going to have to think more cleverly about it. So we need to be sensible about what we try to do. Patients vary in terms of the genetics and biology, so much so that we can miss important differences that determine responses to treatment. You can see that from what I've just said. So to be able to determine whether a new treatment is effective, we need to understand the relevant biology and perhaps develop biomarkers and able to identify patients who may or may not do well in trials and subdivide them accordingly. And also to make sure that we stratify using that uh, information to be able to make sure we get sensible answers out of trials. So what are we doing with a clinical trial? What we're doing is we're doing any research study that prospectively assigns human participants or groups or humans to one or more health-related interventions to evaluate the effects on health outcomes. That's the WHO gobbledygook for describing it. It covers a wide range from drugs to radiotherapy to looking at quality of life in issues to looking about ways in which we can improve quality of life, improve the life of people who have these sorts of tumours. So it's vital to establish whether new approaches are better than an old one and if it isn't, there's very little point in persisting with it. And that's another important principle because, for example, there are quite a lot of trials going on in the States looking at one or two drugs which are persisting with a particular drug because there's money in it. And we have to think very carefully about whether this is a good idea or not. Perhaps the money ought to be spent doing something else. So why trials? Well, the big, simple answer is why, why do people get brain tumors? They get it because there's a degree of human variation which we believe is reflected in the genetics. And why is it hard, so hard to show that one drug treatment is better than another? Simply for the same reason, is that people vary enormously uh, in uh, or their makeup. An example of this kind of thing would be, this is just a simple thing I picked up out of the newspaper, uh, people in a nursing home, 548 were vaccinated, 470 not vaccinated, 21% of the vaccinated group uh, got flu, 33% of the non-vaccinated group, you'd say, right, oh, we're all going to be vaccinated from now on. But actually, if you think of all the factors which could come in there, are they on vitamin C, what's their lifestyle, what drug intake, what previous vaccinations have, what's their genetics, and the bias, who would go and take, have a vaccination? I mean, people like me are so disorganised, just don't get around to doing it, and there are better people around who get it done and all the rest of it, and so on. Self-selection plays a huge point in trying to sort it. So these kind of biases and confounding factors are very important parts of how we need to deal with this. So there are two issues we often have to deal with. The first is randomization. And by randomizing people in trials, 
we can blind ourselves to what's actually going on. That's blind you as patients and blind ourselves as uh, investigators as to what's going on. And this is hugely advantageous because it means the result that we get is clear. We can see that there are no, those confounding factors are accounted for. The problem for patients, of course, is that they'll say, yeah, it's a great trial, doc. I'm really interested in being involved in it, but I want to make sure I get the drug. So you have to say, well, yes, but the drug... Will, the reason why we're doing the trial is because the current drug that you're on as it is not possibly very good, or, if it, or it may be better than the other one, and we don't really know. We are equipoised, and therefore we have to go about... Doing, oh, yeah, but that's fine. I'm all right with you there. I'll sign up to anything. You can do what you like to me. You can cut my head open again. You can do what you like but I want to get that drug. And so this is one of the problems we have, and, and, it's, and it's human nature to want what they think is best. The answer is we have to be very careful how we tell patients about trials and what we're actually doing. So randomization, mostly in what we call the higher grade, higher phase trials, that's the phase two, three trials, very important in terms of uh, being able to stop us from making wrong decisions about what's going on. Um, and trial design, that is trying to design a trial to get rid of those elements of bias, is what our clinical trials units are very important at doing. And this is a critical issue, numbers of patients. When you're doing simple observational studies, a few patients will give you an idea of whether you're getting a response or not. But when you're trying to define small percentage differences, let's say differences that are valuable, two, three months in survival, in situations such as I showed you right at the beginning, you need lots of patients. And uh, as some of you may well be aware that one of the bevacizumab trial, for example, needed nearly uh, 450, 500 of patients to get it to work. The next trial that we do, which includes IDH1 and all these sorts of things, uh, the big phase three trial, the next one is going to need nearly 1,000 patients to be able to show that three months difference if, we, if it's going to do it at all. So powering these th things up starts to become incredibly expensive. So it's very important that you're aware uh, uh, of some of these issues as well. And then there are ethical issues. If I said to you, um, well, I wonder whether aggressive surgery for glioblastoma actually does, makes things worse, makes the tumour grow. Because what you're doing is you're improving the oxygenation, uh, you're taking the pressure off the tumour, and it grows much, much better. And maybe what we ought to be doing is doing some kind of trial where we don't do surgery. And people would say, mm, I'm not sure you should do that. And I can tell you, the MRC said to me, mm, I, don't, I don't like that idea at all. Patients won't go for that. They believe that surgery is a very important one. So there are some taboos in here which we struggle with. What about having a no radiotherapy arm? Does radiotherapy make it harder for us to test some other types of drugs? And that's a really difficult one because all our patients with high-grade glial tumours get surgery and radiotherapy. And that's the principal starting point. So you've always got to be having that in your equation before you start assessing anything else. And that makes it very difficult to know uh, how, you're, how you're going to take some of these trials for. High risk. Right, what I want to do is take a live virus and I want to inject it into a brain tumour and see how it goes. Right, which one do you want to use? Well, actually, I'd quite like to use the one that causes smallpox, if that's all right with you. Um, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the plan, uh, actually, next year, is to be starting to inject these tumours with... So, high-risk procedures. Patients, actually, I don't have a problem with it. It's the, it's the ethics committees who say, What? God, I hope you're insured. And then there are a lot of other problems. Uh, there's a, I often wonder, and you may often wonder, whether steroids do more harm to patients than good in the long run. And are, is there, for example, in the immune studies we're doing, a problem to do with giving steroids? Uh, do we think that maybe the steroids could actually be affecting the capacity to get a good response in the immune studies? And, of course, it's very difficult to do trials where you'd say to a patient, well, we're going to take a risk with you. And then at the bottom of my pile, but by no means the least, is the fact there are a lot of things out there which I'm sure you're asked about and I'm asked about that is, I don't think we're ever going to be able to do trials in because there just isn't the money there or the interest or the conventional wisdom of the dominant research groups' capacity to be able to take on board to let us do. So there are all sorts of issues in there that we ought to be looking at that we can't possibly do. So I'm just going to take you quickly through phasing of trials to give you a feel for what we're actually doing in different trials, and then I'm going to address this issue of how we can do things a bit better. So phase one trials um, is really taking a drug which has been tested in animals, giving it for the first time in humans, 
Um, and you might say, well, that's great. It's been tested in an animal. There's little soft furry bunnies. It seemed to be OK. We'll stick it into a human, and we'll see how we get on. And uh, there are relatively few participants. We tend to do probably less between 10 and 20 of that. And the aim is to find either a safe dose or look at an acceptable level of safety so that we can classify that for taking into further trials. These are complicated issues because you have to record absolutely everything that's going on uh, because you just don't know what to expect. Just because it does makes an animal seem more friendly, for example, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be you know, have the same effect in humans. So you have to be very, very careful, and I'll show you an example uh, of where we got it, uh, we just misunderstood what was going on. Phase two studies take it one step further. We're now looking for an effect. Is that effect going to be enough for us to say, right, let's talk to a big farmer about spending a lot of money? Can we get enough data together to say, we, we, wouldn't, we would expect perhaps out of 20 patients, if five respond, we'd think that's enough to take this further. And that's very important. And that's where all this business of mixing together biology, mixing together stratification, now becomes a really critical issue at trying to make sure you get the best test groups to be able to, to work this one through. So this is, the, this is the phase two idea. Phase three is where you're taking your best available treatment. So that is, in our case, for glioblastoma, be radiation and temozolomide, and you compare this against radiation and temozolomide and something else. And so the idea is to say, is it better? And, of course, that's hugely important because uh, uh, you really must demonstrate, and that's where all your blinding and all the rest of it comes in. But you can see it's getting progressively more expensive to do these sorts of trials. Phase four is a marketing one. It's post-registration. It's really to do with what's going on at that level. And down the bottom, I put here adaptive design. This is really thinking about the fact that if you do a phase one study, look at the results and say, right, that was pretty good. I think we'll do a phase two. You're talking time. So the idea is to compress time so that you can shoot through these phases. And one of the ways to do it is to put a control phase right in at the beginning. So you've got a patient having a control treatment right at the beginning. And that means that you can then start doing these designs where you alter doses and you alter some of the measurements and you alter some of the stratification of the patients as you go along to pick the best combinations. And that means that you can float through these a lot more effectively. Um, I'm not going to say much more about that, but, but this is a very important development and it's probably going to save us millions in this country in terms of developing drugs by comparison with other countries. Uh, so in phase one, is a new treatment safe? All patients get this treatment, so that's the whole point, really. You want to give it to all the patients that you give it. But particularly safety. Safety is the big issue. Is it safe to give a new treatment? The risks are higher because we don't know how these drugs are going to behave or what's actually going to happen. And the entry criteria may be stiffer. And that's because sometimes you're selecting patients who've got a very particular scan, very particular um, uh, pathology, whatever it happens to be, to enable us to be able to be clear about what our target actually is. And much more patient involvement with visits, scans and blood tests uh, that we may actually be doing. And this is a study we've just completed. This is putting uh, uh, erinotecan labelled beads into patients with recurrent glioblastoma at reoperation. Um, so this is using a drug which is well known, erinotecan, um, and uh, putting it in very high doses. And the reason we're putting it in very high doses is we've never been able to escalate this dose systemically because it's too toxic. So the idea was to put it in very high doses directly into the brain, <coughs> release it over a period of time, see whether we could get uh, some benefit from all of this. I can't tell you the results of this because the company have told me I'm not allowed to say, uh, but we will be uh, uh, talking about it a bit at BNOS. Um, and let's say there's a son of... Uh, the study, Son of IDEB, coming up on, uh, on, the, on the card soon. So uh, this is just a very... Uh, so these are my reasons for doing it. it uh, this drug has not really been tested systemically. It works completely differently from temozolomide. It's a possibility that it might be an effective drug. And we don't know, really, because it depends on some other features, uh, conditional biological uh, biomarker features, which might uh, um, be important. But if it does work in patients, it creates what we call double-strand breaks, which are irrecoverable. So you haven't got the same kind of repair issues that you might have with other drugs. And uh, these, are, these are the reasons why we put it in the brain. 80% uh, of glioma recurrence is local to the tumour. We can get a much bigger dose in. Uh, we get a prolonged exposure. Drug loss from putting things into... Go, if you put drugs in the brain locally, the leakage out is virtually minimal. Uh, so you can put high doses in and not worry about systemic loading. 
and the injection procedure is safe. Well, that's really what we set out to do. And in this study, uh, we, we, we injected these uh, fine beads. They're about uh, uh, one to a, a thousand microns in size, and uh, I, I injected them into patients uh, at reoperation. Uh, I won't go into that, but just to point out to you that it's very important to do your preclinical stuff. So this is an example of a poor rat uh, that was treated with these uh, bees to show safety and indeed uh, enabling us to demonstrate, for example, if you put beads in without the drug in a tumour, uh, uh, with a drug in the tumour, we can get rid of the tumour, whereas here we put in sham beads without the drug and you can see the tumour is growing. So this kind of data is what helps you get funding to carry on um, and uh, that's the way we go. So we, uh, we've done a, a number of patients uh, in this study uh, and I'm glad to say it's all gone very well. What I wanted to show you was this bit. So this was a 20-month study. We, accrued, we screened 12 patients. Who's had to screen patients for trials here? It's a fun experience, isn't it? It can be difficult. Uh, we were actually recruited nine. There were, with this, there were 70 now outpatient appointments associated with this particular study and those patients. Over 6,000 data items. 463 adverse event forms had to be filled in and signed by me. Uh, there were four uh, uh, clinical toxicity criteria, one to two uh, only, 71 MRI scans, and God knows how many man stroke woman hours, if I can put it that way, uh, uh, to deliver all of this. So few patients, very labor intensive, and then we've got to talk them into whether we can carry on uh, doing more. So this is a phase one study, that's how it, that's how it goes. Phase two, we're talking about what's the dose? What's the best dose in a patient? Does it shrink the tumour? Does it keep the tumour away for longer? Does it make the patient feel better? Can they tolerate this treatment? Uh, or in this case, most of the patients, or all the patients get treatment, dose escalation may increase the unpleasant side. You're definitely trying to increase the dose until the patients don't like it. Okay? Why? Because you want to work at the best dose you possibly can. And, of course, the reason is because you want to increase the anti-tumour effect uh, and you've got to balance these two off uh, to be able to then work uh, into a further trial. So the operatic study is an interesting one. This is a fascinating study looking at uh, a thing called a PARP inhibitor in combination uh, with temozolomide. Uh, and the, the idea behind it, uh, let's go to this study, is that, uh, sorry, is that temozolomide causes changes in DNA which are then repaired by two different pathways. And uh, as you know, if you've got um, uh, a methylated tumour, then you're more likely to have this response and this, uh, uh, you don't have this repair uh, uh, process going on. So the damage done by the DNA is maintained. But there is a second pathway which is active here, and that runs all the time, this so-called base excision repair pathway. And if you can inhibit the enzyme involved with that so-called PARP, uh, 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 then uh, there's a chance of inhibiting the DNA repair there. So DNA is damaged by temozolomide. That's a good thing. Okay, you want that damage to stay and not be repaired. And if you could use a PARP inhibitor to sustain that effect, you might even be able to reverse some of the uh, 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 problems we have in giving uh, temozolomide to uh, patients who are unresponsive. Not only that, but because you're talking about DNA damage, what the exciting possibility is that radiation enhancement with PARP inhibitors may be dramatic. So that's, uh, I know uh, uh, Tony's thinking about that as well. So this is a two-stage stu two, two study. What it was designed to do is, first of all, detect whether the drug got into the brain, and second, to look at tolerability and dosing. Why, now, why, why testing the drug getting in the brain? Well, the answer for that is, in the animal studies we've done, uh, well, he, I didn't do them, he, uh, they were doing up in Glasgow, there was no real convincing evidence that the drug got into the brain. And that was a, that was a real problem uh, to take it further. So, I mean, we all baited breath on the first couple of cases to see whether the drug actually got into the brain because animal studies had not helped us so far. So this study is continuing at the moment and it's in what we call a dose extension phase. And it's probably, uh, I think it's probably the, one of the few trials I've ever seen completely morph into another trial in the space of two years. I, I don't know how they've got away with it, but it has. Um, so it's an interesting trial. So stage one to determine whether it got in the brain. Stage two was looking at dosing. 
And uh, this is the most interesting study uh, because it showed in all the patients they did right at the beginning, the drug actually got into the tumour and in really good concentrations. So that was a really useful study from that point of view. The most difficult bit has been now been working out the combination of drugs uh, to use uh, for, for safety uh, in uh, a further trial. They've been doing other things, and this is characteristic of trials now, though, that we have a biological component, a translational component, which looks at other features. Can imaging help us define elements of how there's response going on here, or whether the drug's getting in, and so on. So the idea of adding these components into trials to try and understand more is a very critical part of what we're actually doing. Phase three, uh, as I was talking about, is really about, is this the treatment the best available by comparison? So this is where randomis randomization comes in, between, uh, including hopefully investigator and patient blinding. And this is where a situation where not all patients will receive the new treatment. They may receive the placebo. So this is very, very important to uh, 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 deal with it. However, increasingly we're designing trials where at the end of the assessment period, patients can transfer into the treatment site. And we're thinking more and more about that to try and encourage patients to take part. The critical part, uh, 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 and it's the only time I'll mention NICE at all this morning, is that NICE would use this data to define health benefit over existing treatment. And this is very, very important. You go through the whole business of doing this. It's a wonderful drug, saves lives, it's fantastic that, but it costs an arm and a leg to be able to give it to each patient. Uh, and currently the ISA for this is still £30,000 and we don't know quite how this is going to be altered over the next year. But that's not a lot of money in drug company terms to enable us to give you access to some of the drug. So all of this, it depends very much on this, but at the same time money comes into it. Uh, uh, so very quickly, an example of, uh, of two of these. Uh, uh, DC Vax, which I'm afraid has been, as you know, halted for the moment. Does anybody know why? i tell you why, because the FDA are looking into the company at the moment, uh, and it's very worrying. But this is a, it was an exciting study where, whereby you take the patient's tumour. Isn't that interesting? You take the patient's tumour, their tumour, not a, a batch of tumour, their tumour, and what you do is you then look for antigens on it, which should stimulate dendritic cells. That's what you're interested in. And then you then take the patient's blood, you isolate their dendritic cell, white cell component, and you put them together with their tumour, and then you amplify the dendritic cells to create a vaccine. And you just inject it back into the arm. These dendritic cells go into your lymph nodes, teach the T cells how to go and kill tumour, and that's what they're designed to do. So it's specific for you. It's the first of the absolutely, truly personalised therapies. A very exciting study. Lots of problems in doing it, but it's a very exciting study to do. So uh, this, this idea of, of, of developing the immune system to, to, to attack uh, the tumours is a, a, a real, really important principle that's going on at the moment. But here we are. We've got involved with this. The effort at setting this up, I cannot tell you, getting plasmapheresis in place and then putting patients through the mill. So the patients have to first consent to having tissue taken. Then they have to consent to having plasmapheresis. And then they have to consent to having vaccination done. And then we've got all the business of testing their bloods, and doing their imaging, getting them all screened, getting them all ready. And then it comes back, there's not enough tissue, or they don't express the antigens, or someone dropped the bottle in the plane. Or, you know, and it's just, it's just, I got, ah. Oh. Anyway, we've got a few patients into it. And uh, uh, King's College has done really well at getting numbers into this. And, off. and there you are. The trial is stopped just when we thought we were going to, to get somewhere with it. So it's a really upsetting business. Um, what about this one? This is an interesting one. This is the one that I just, just don't understand at all. This is a, a fascinating study where they we're using uh, these electric fields in the head. And it's been out there now for two or three years. We've seen all the data, but none of us believe it. And, and, and that's because we are... I don't know what, maybe we're mad. Uh, but maybe we just don't understand what we're dealing with here. Maybe we just don't like the idea of it. I don't know. But the idea of wearing plasters for the nine months of your life seems to me a little bit uncomfortable. And no, I suppose you could wear a wig over it and all that kind of thing. But the patients I've seen uh, seem to have a, lot, a number of problems with skin itching and difficulty and so on. But they, they tolerate it well. They carry a background. It's got the, the machine in. And uh, I, I, anybody have looked after patients with these? I think we've had a couple in Edinburgh, haven't we? Uh, we should dealt with it. And the patients tolerate it quite well and so on. Now, the thing that's really bizarre about this is that, in fact, it seems to do something. Um, so if you look at these uh, data published by uh, Roger Stuck, uh, showing um, a control group, which is Timozolomide group, and then having this Novo TTF study, 
uh, you've got to you've got to say, well, what's that? What's that, that data? Well, I don't know. Maybe we should. Maybe we should be having everybody walking around with, um, you know, transistor radios and, and caps on. Uh, uh, this is, well, maybe we should be doing this. The slight problem is that the control arm is worse than the, than the study. Um, so you wonder what, quite what's going on in that group. Um, and actually, this one is only just as, about, as good as it. So there are some questions that we all have about the trial, and we keep hunting for questions. But actually, this data is reasonably robust, and it's sitting there. And uh, we think, well, maybe we should do this. Well, of course, NICE looked at this, and they said, well, what's the cost of all of this? Uh, our colleague of mine who writes uh, interesting articles for New Scientists um, uh, developed a brain tumor, and he uh, decided this was great. He's a scientist. He thought something scientific, electric fields in the brain, I'll go for that. Until he discovered it was going to cost him £17,000 per month uh, to be able to do this treatment. So that's why you don't see many people running around doing all of this. So that's a phase three trial that's shown a positive result and yet a totally useless one because we can't afford to do it. So quickly, growth areas in cancer, I think, are immunotherapy, viral gene therapy coming on, nanotechnology, ultra-early diet, and managing the cancer biology. I won't go into that in a moment. What I want to do is to go quickly to a point here. So what about numbers going into trials? This is a slightly old slide. I need to stand over here. Sorry. I'm sorry. So what it looks at is how many people are we actually getting into trials and this is uh, looking at the idea that of 4,207 possible patients, then uh, we actually got in what looks like 10% or something like that in this time period, 2002 to 2004. Slightly erroneous data because uh, if you break this down into the patients going into real trials versus observational studies, then the numbers are not uh, terribly brilliant. And given, oops, given the fact that we now recognize from all the work they've been doing in MDTs and cancer, uh, cancer intelligence and so on, that there are a lot of people out there with brain tumors, and a lot of them are having problems, then we've got to be boxed a little bit more clever about what we think a reasonable um, uh, recruitment should actually be. Not only that, but we recognize that patients at different stages in their disease represent a different entity from the point of view of the biology and how we would actually manage them and how we'd actually take them forward. So we tend to identify people with recurrent disease, for example, from patients who are new patients, as it were, and then we might define them up in other different ways, uh, depending on all of these, as well as, as I said at the beginning, all the issues to do with stratification from the genetics and so on. So this uh, uh, presents quite a complex problem. But if we want to see results, we've got to actually be picking the right groups of patients to be able to persuade people that we can take some of these ideas forward. So this is a quick uh, table that Colin Watts sent me recently. Do the percentage of cancer patients relative to incidents going in. And the figure for brain tumors is two, two and a half, three percent, something like that. Note, Cancer Research UK would say to you, the figure that we are aiming at is 20% recruitment across cancer. They're probably running at about 17.5%, something like that sort of figure. We're doing very well. The US figure is 5%, something like that. You say, well, well not so bad. Doing better than the US, you must be doing well. Actually, this is not very good. Um, and if you look at the very best clinicians who are recruiting patients into trials, uh, and I've looked at 100 uh, who are doing this, 20, the, about, uh, uh, those, the, the best ones are getting about 25% of their patients into trials. And it, it's important to understand, as you've heard from what I've said, that there is the simple phase one trial, which is actually very, very, sorry, simple phase three trials where you're just giving a drug and measuring something, and these very complex phase ones. So the amount you can get into trials depends a little bit on what you're actually doing. But let's say a very good recruiter can get quite these sorts of numbers into trials. That sets a standard that we need to think very carefully about, and we need to be looking at what the best units are achieving. So if the best unit can get a certain number in, then why aren't the other units able to do it if they had the right level support? Thank you. Uh, OK, I'm going to stop in a moment. OK, right, sorry. But, um, so there are all these issues which are barriers to recruitment. Um, and uh, I think you need to be aware, of course, about the trials on the NCRI website, for those of you who are interested. So the access to that, if you go to NCRI website, uh, Brain Tumor Trials, there are the two sets of trial uh, portfolios there which deal with intrinsic primary tumours 
and the second panel deals with metastases, meningiomas, rarer tumours and others. And in it, you'll see stages of the disease, and you click on each of these little boxes, and they tell you what trials are available, and importantly, who to ring. The depressing thing is an awful lot of these are closed, or not available, or limited, or whatever it happens to be. But nonetheless, uh, uh, this is a website you should really be well aware of. So, uh, all patients should be in a trial. I think we don't have enough treatments. We certainly don't have enough people, but... We need to say, how can you practically take this forward? We need to understand we cannot recruit all these patients, but we can all, that's you, me, and everybody else, reasonably aim to recruit to the level of the best units in the UK. Now, if we just did that alone, just did that alone, we would massively increase the number of patients going into trials. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I ever asked.